Thank you, Charlie. It's a pleasure to be here today. I'm Ann Occupinzi, the Assistant Dean for Professional Education at the school. I'm joined by colleagues Sarah Stillman and Megan Karen, giving waiting opportunities, Michael Byrne, and students Sundas Sapor in our MPH 65 Health and Social Behavior, and Emma, okay, Emma Langle. Uh, from the Quantitative Methods Field of Study within the MPH 45. I'm going to talk to you a bit about our school and our program and then give you plenty of time to ask questions of us and also specifically of our students. Uh, first, I'd love, because I can't see you today, because I know there's a lot of you in there, but I would love to have a sense of where, where you all are. I wonder if you might be able to take a moment and into the chat, put in where you are and what time of day it is where you are moment in that. Thanks. Okay. Well, actually, I'm going to go against all wisdom to turn off my slide so I can see. So Florida, Washington, D.C., California, Ghana, Tunam, Jackson, New York City, Fort Myers, Kentucky, Stanford, Tanzania, London, Abu Dhabi, Kenya, Jersey City, I'm a Jersey girl, I gotta say, uh, Tokyo, Saudi Arabia. Wow. Okay. Amazing. 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 Great, Philly. Okay, I I love to see this. India is also I love to see this both because I love to see this, but uh, when we pick what time these sessions are, it's also nice to know what uh, what exactly we're what time zones are all joining us in. So what we're going to do in the next hour is um, I want to talk a little bit about you know why you even come to Harvard, um, then why an MPH which field of study should I and could I apply to? Because we have a sense of just how complicated our offerings are. So we wanna to try to help you with that a little bit. Uh, some demographics for you, because I think as future public health students, you probably like your data, probably like your data more than I like data, well, I'm sure. <laughs> and then we're gonna leave some time for the question and answer part. So uh, first I just wanna talk a little bit about why you might choose to come to Harvard. and. And there's, I guess, for me, the reason why you would, and then one reason why I think shouldn't be your top reason. And I'm going to take that one down first. So um, some of you, sometimes people are like, well, it's Harvard, the name. And uh, we actually don't really want you to come only because of the name. I want you to want to come here for other reasons. And I think we have other pretty convincing and compelling reasons why you might want to come study with us. So when you look at the course catalog in my Harvard, or if you look in curriculum guides, I'm hoping you see classes that really speak to you. And you're like, that is something I'm really passionate about, like what they have. We have practicum opportunities that hopefully you see and you're like, wow, I didn't even know I could do things like that. That looks amazing. Um, something you really probably can't see ahead of time and you'll get just a small glimmer of it during the question and answer time is, the peer group that you will meet will be an extraordinary peer group. We consistently say that our students are the best thing that we have going in the school. And, uh, and we keep saying it because it's true and we mean it. They really are the, uh, that. the faculty, not to dismiss the faculty, especially the one being recorded. <laughs> um, but the faculty are obviously world renowned, wonderful uh, researchers and, and practitioners. Also, another thing you might choose to come to is if you're thinking you want to experience things beyond just the Harvard TH Chan School of Public Health, but across Harvard University experiences, classes, uh, networking opportunities. So those are some things just a little bit about Harvard. But then an MPH, why an MPH? So an MPH, a Master of Public Health, is, is a practice-oriented degree. Uh, meaning that even though you may want to be getting some additional research skills, uh, which certainly, especially um, in the bio and epi that all MPH students take and certain fields of study focus more on it. But in general, it's not really all about the research as much as it's about getting this core foundation in public health uh, that will cover things like the qualitative methods and leadership, communication, health policy, all. Students will also take biostats and epi. And then 
you will have your own field of study of a specific area of interest that you want to go more deeply in, and then electives across anything you want to be doing. Those things combined with practicum projects are what makes an MPH an, an MPH. So it may be um, that you want to, you might be a med student right now, and you think I want some public health training now that will inform my career. You might be, um, have been out of college and been working for a few years and you want to kind of pivot and focus more in a public health kind of job. So there's a lot of different reasons that you could be coming to do this and, and it can help and transform your, your career. So the, the practicum, which I just mentioned, is really your defining experience within an MPH. And within the school's website, I have to say that I think the field practice office has the best stuff to go look at. So, so dig in on this later on, but there are just remarkable things that you can see of what the students have been doing over the past bunch of years that are all in there, but you can see a lot of different opportunities that people have and they, many students go on to later publish their practicum product, but there's a lot of wonderful learning and just richness of what, what goes on. And, and practicum projects happen around the world in the US, in Boston, but they can be far and wide, all sorts of different settings and different placements. Um, so this is the beginning of when I mentioned that sometimes we know things can be a little bit confusing <laughs> with the way that we have different offerings at our school. So I'm gonna try to capture this in sort of a high level way. So we have, uh, variations in the MPH and a lot of how you would decide which one is the right one for you partly depends on your own eligibility for this, like your own experience and what you want within your own life. So looking, for example, at um, the things that we are most commonly talking about, which are our on-campus residential programs of a 45 credit one, which is typically run within a year, unless it's taking place in a different summer thing, and a, and a 65 credit one, which is basically a year and a half for three semesters. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about those in a second. We also have an MPH and epidemiology program, which falls into that 45 credit program. That is predominantly online, except for two uh, months of June in which people come in person. And we have a new all online, program called the MPH Generalist, and that um, is part-time, all online, generally two years, but possibly a third. And then we do have some assortment of um, a couple of joint degree programs with Harvard's Law School and Harvard's um, Design School. And actually, for those of you who are in a U.S. med school, sometimes people come in the middle in that way, MD, MPH way, but that you could be in any US med school on that one. Okay, so that gives you a little bit of the different kinds. And then you would say to yourself, but how do I know which one? <laughs> so let's say that you have gone to college. I'm gonna start with the 65, because I think it's a little bit simpler to think about, which is it, if you are looking at the MPH 65, then we are assuming that you have gone to college, graduated from college, and have at least two years of work experience, but not more than five years of work experience. And then within those fields of study, it's available in health management, health policy, health and social behavior, and nutrition. So one question that I sometimes get asked is someone's like, I, I have six years of experience, and I'm interested in health policy. So will that six years of experience uh, mean that I have a better chance of getting into the health policy 65? No. If you have more than five years of experience, you are eligible for and should apply to the, the shorter program, the MPH 45. So that this program is for someone earlier in their career and a little bit uh, have less of your whole professional identity completely formed. In most cases, you're taking most of the same courses, but obviously you take more and the practicum is a little bit different and the cohort experience is a little bit different, but that is what you decide. Now, if you um, just went to, you just graduated from, or you're, grad, you're in college right now, you're a senior and you graduate 
this May, but you have uh, been working part-time um, at while you were in college and you have a lot of summer internships that add up to two years. No, you are not eligible for this and you, we would love to see you in a couple of years and we believe that you will get so much more out of the program if you work a little bit first and then come to us later. And you will also see that this is one of the defining differences between us and some of our peers is that when you're in that classroom, you have this richness of experience that the classmates are bringing. So if you're in college now, hold but come back for us. <laughs> but if you are, uh, otherwise you just need to have two years by the time you come to us. So by the time of matriculation. So then for the MPH 45, where things get a lot more complicated, but I will talk briefly about it, but also hope that you spend some time later with different eligibility charts or talking with members of our team if that becomes helpful. But you know, we see all these different fields of study. Clinical effectiveness basically is like, um, and we'll talk more about clinical effectiveness kind of skews our numbers a little because there's so many of them and they're pretty much mostly the uh, doctor world. But in general, what we're saying for the MPH 45 is that historically, most of the people have some kind of doctoral degree, either an MD or an MD equivalent from different countries, uh, sometimes a PhD, sometimes a JD. So something of that category or people often having a bachelor's plus at least five years of work experience. So that's where, again, if you're deciding between the two, if you have the five years, we are treating it in that way. Or if you have a master's degree, a successful applicant with a master's degree would have some uh, work experience pairing with that. But if that's your category, that will be again worth digging more deeply on the specific area that you're applying to. Okay, so just for some perspective on what it all looks like, or how big the program is. So we do have 446 new total MPA students who entered this year. And to just to give you a sense of kind of how the school feels, you can see that it is more of these MPH 45s. So almost 75% is that. And then 26% of, of the entering class is of the MPH 65. Now, of course, because the MPH 65 span two years, there's there still ends up being more of a presence of them than, than that. And then altogether right now we have 665 MPH students new and returning. And you can see that most people are full-time. Um, some, we have 26% part-time. And then this summer only, which pertains only to the clinical effectiveness field of study where people come just for the summers and um, maybe do a little online work in around the year. And I mentioned, because you can see you know, Harvard's a place full of lots of acronyms and abbreviations. And so these other the chart on the side has the different fields of study. And we have this up just so you have a sense of how big or small these are. And that's actually also why I said clinical effectiveness kind of skews things with 100. And, 57, but you can see um, the generalist, which just started this year, is quite small at 24. We anticipate this upcoming year having that be a bigger cohort size. And um, but also you can see that the MPH 65, um, in some cases, you know, these are these numbers look a little bigger because we're representing two years of it, where the other the MPH 45 students are generally just here for for one year. Um, so like as an example, nutrition has 26 students, but they are 13 per year for cohort. Okay. And uh, kind of fun to just see how international uh, the program is, 67 nationalities represented. And um, the map tells us we have a few areas that we'd like to really, uh, you know, have some other people apply for. <laughs> but, but it's amazing to see that with 600 and 60 odd students that 67 nationalities are represented. 30% international now, often our numbers, um, I would say pre-pandemic were a little bit higher and I assume it's gonna kind of go back up to that, but we uh, generally will see between 30 and 40%. And then you can see around the world, just all the different 
the continents that are represented. And I think you could see even from the chat room at the beginning that we, we have an international draw and that is really part of what is a defining and enhancing part of the experience. So sometimes you may wonder, what do people then later do? And this data is pulled from um, our career office. And the reason I keep referencing how the clinical effectiveness number skews the data is that you'll especially see it here in the MPH 45, because of course there's a huge number who are going into hospital and healthcare because there's a huge uh, proportion of people who are actually practicing physicians or are going to stay practicing physicians. So, and, and that is actually true in general in the MPH 45, in the, you know, the clinical effectiveness makes it seem more so, but you see looking at the 65, the variety of fields that people will explore. So consulting and um, government, nonprofit, NGO, university research, all, all different popular areas. And you'll see a variety of things as well in the MPH 45. It's hard to say what people go on to do in the sense that people come in with such a wide variety of experiences and that obviously shapes what they then go on to. Uh, I want to be covering a little bit about the application requirements um, to just say that, you know, I think we all know this, but applications are due December 1st. And while it seems perhaps silly for me to mention to make sure that your letters and transcripts are, <laughs> arrive on time, I find it very sad when you put all your effort into your application, but until it is marked complete, it doesn't make its way to reviewers. So I would suggest as my biggest piece of advice for you around this process is have your, you know, work on your statement, which is our only way to really read your whole story to know like, hmm, I wonder why this program makes sense for this person and what, what have you done and what will you be able to do once you get it? So we wanna see a nice statement. We wanna see letters of someone who knows you and knows your work. I, I would say for most reviewers that it matters more that they know you and know your work rather than uh, their like the, the title of someone at a high up place who hardly knows you. So I, I will put that out there. But once you get these people signed on to get your letters, please keep nudging them to make sure that you have a complete application in by December 1st. So the sooner you do that, not that we're rolling emissions, but the sooner you do it, just the better it is for making sure that your application um, gets the review that it needs to get in a timely manner. Um, and so we're gonna take questions now, uh, but also we want to say that if later on you're like, oh, I have other questions that I wish I had asked, if you email mph at hsph.harvard.edu, that would be one way to contact us. And also we are happy to offer that Megan, who I introduced at the beginning, if you are later like, hmm, I would like some other information. Megan is the newest member of our team and has provided a Calendly link that will take you in there so you could sign up for a chat with her to find out a little bit more. So from that, I'm going to open up to see what we have for questions. Thanks so much, Anne. So we have a lot of questions. Um, and I thought maybe we would start first with a series of questions that we got about eligibility, um, which as you alluded to, can be a somewhat tricky and complex um, piece. So I thought we would start there since we do have a fair number of questions around that. Yes. Um, so the first question that I wanted to pose to you um, was about the around work experience years. Um, a student, uh, an applicant is asking, are clinical years in dentistry, would those count as work experience? Um, so I guess I'll start with that question first. Yeah. So if, if someone is a dentist, which is a doctoral degree, then you would automatically become, you would be eligible for the MPH 45. If you were, I guess, the question I would wonder if you were a dentist, if you were practicing dentistry in some place that did not require a doctoral degree, uh, 
then the work then that would count for work experience. Thanks, okay. Anne. Um, if a if an applicant is not able to meet the five years of work experience, they hold just a bachelor's degree by the time that they matriculate. Um, you know, there may be maybe a few months short, for example. Should they apply to the 65 program? So if you if your if your college degree is um, like May five years and four months before matriculation, but you had a couple of month breaks somewhere in there, I think you would be okay to apply to the 45. And if a reviewer felt that that was not going to suffice, they could refer you internally to a corresponding 65 if, there, if that option were to exist. If we were saying you graduated four and a half years ago, then and then you should not apply to the, you know, if you if if you're talking like a, a more significant chunk, like four and a half, you know, if it's four and a half years, somehow you're a mid-year grad and you have something like that, then I would say you should just apply to the 65. Thanks, Sam. That's really helpful. Um, so I'm just gonna scroll back up. Um, I'm gonna ask a quick question about our um MUP, MPH, the joint right. degree. Uh -huh. um, as, uh, an applicant is curious um, if there will be a session about this, um, which I know currently we do not have one planned, but if you could just provide a couple um, points around um, eligibility for that program. Yes, great. So we have a joint degree program with Harvard's Design School. It's a master's in urban planning and a master's of public health. It is a very small program that usually has one to two students in any given year. Uh, I, would, I would suggest probably that um, that person email the MPH email about it, but in general, you take, uh, so it still requires that you have some work experience before you come. However, you could, I think you could just actually have one year of work experience because you then begin at the design school and they have um, less, their work requirement is not as stringent as ours. So you could begin there, you apply there, you start there, and then you come to us in the second year of the program. And then in the third year, you span both places. So uh, that is how that particular program works. And there's a kind of a practicum-ish project that joins the, the two places. And it doesn't line up with a specific field of study as much as your statement should indicate to us which field of study you're envisioning it and why, and then, and then it will get reviewed that way and you would follow that curriculum. So it's a very kind of unusual program. I will also say for someone interested in it, but with a different level, like you, one also could go pursue a master's of urban planning uh, at, and then later come and go into the MPH 45 also just as a different pathway. Thanks, Anne. So this is a little bit more about, and I imagine it's probably about our MPH 65 program um, in particular, but do the five years of work experience need to be post-baccalaureate and could work experience during college be considered? So the work, so it must be full-time work experience. So it is, in most situations that we see, it is unlikely that someone has full-time work experience while in college, unless they were an alternate, you know, if they were, a, if they were a full-time person who then went to Scott College part-time. So I think um, there could be certain situations. And I feel like I lost the first part of the question. <laughs> That's no, okay. So, so does does the work experience piece have to be post baccalaureate? Um, so, I will say, in breaking news for Charlie, <laughs> that going forward next year, uh, the MPH steering committee is has voted to make sure that not this year's admission cycle, but next year's admission cycle, that there is a pathway for someone who 
who's proceeded in an alternative way. So if you had been working in some doing a clinic work and then went to college later in life and then wanted to come after that, that pathway is going to be changing next year. So if you're in an undetermined zone, you could look for that for next year. Uh, for right now, if you're, what is confusing about this particular example for me is if it's the five year and the two year. So I think we may need that person to take the time in the chat to re-clarify which they're talking about, because it would be really unusual for us to see it the MPH 45. I think there may be something that we might be more likely to see within the MPH 65, but I think the eligibility on the five years and the 45 is going to be unlikely. But I'm happy to revisit that one. Thanks, Anne. Um, so we have a couple different questions. Um, and I imagine we don't necessarily have specifics for this, but a, an applicant is wondering about what the average number of applicants per program are and what the general statistics are around being admitted to the our MPH program. Yeah, so one thing I think it's important for people to know is that when Harvard goes out with their announcements about how uh, grueling the admission cycle was <laughs> with the numbers that you then see publicized, they're always talking about Harvard College. And Harvard College numbers are actually kind of um, daunting and uh, like a very tiny admit element. One very big difference in my opinion with the public health school is there's a certain self-selecting that already happens because of who you already are to get to the point to actually be able to be eligible to apply, right? So we're, so, you know, it's not like college, uh, high school students around the world here instead it's people who have been, you graduated from college, you either have a doctoral degree, you've been working for, so there's a certain amount that's reduced that down. The applicant pools actually vary pretty wildly across, widely and wildly, I guess, across uh, different fields of study. And so, and so it's actually a very hard question to answer because there's, there's, there's some programs that are tiny and there are some programs that are pretty big um, but I think and, and the admit the admit rates really range widely and in ways that aren't specifically logical like in so I so we actually don't really publicize them as much because they there's this they're not representative of something but I will just say that we're not uh, People have decent chances of getting in, and it is not like the Harvard College 5% kind of number that you hear, but the, the pool varies widely. Thanks, Anne. So before I go on to the next question, we do have two wonderful student representatives here. Yes. So if you have specific questions um, for them about their experience here at the school, um, they'd be more than happy to answer your, any questions that you have. So I just wanted to put in a quick plug for that. And actually, I'm going to add on to that quick plug to also say that not that not that you want to just take their words and put them into your statement, but I will say that this is your chance to think what what is their experience, just to make sure you know that it's partly what you might want out of your experience. So this, please do take up on that opportunity. Great. To make how much more can you listen to me? <laughs> So Anne, I'm going to answer a couple quick questions here. Okay. Someone is asking about um, whether what an MBBS degree would be considered. So that would be considered a doctoral degree. Um, that is sort of the American equivalent of a um, MD, um, just so for those students, so you know that. Um, for students that are looking to apply to the MPH 45 program, um, for our, depending on which field of study in that nine month program, um, you're going to graduate in May of 2023 if you're starting your program um, in the fall of 2022 or the summer of 2022. Um, I just also want to make a note about um, visa eligibility and OPT eligibility because there were a couple questions about um, OPT STEM eligibility. Our MPH um, 45 and 65 residential program are um, student visa eligible and would make you eligible for OPT. Um, and um, our, we have a wonderful Harvard International office that works really closely with students. Um, 
around preparing them for their visa. We do OBT sessions. Um, I will just make a note, um, the MPH and EPI program, um, you would be eligible for brief student visas for the two periods when you would come to campus. And our MPH generalist program is not um, student visa eligible and therefore you would not be able to um, uh, get OPT. Um, so, Anne, would you mind um, just sharing the great news about whether or not the GRE is required? Well, I would be delighted to speak to that. <laughs> so this year for the second year in a row, we will not only not be requiring the GRE, but we are, the, the MPH program is uh, what we are calling test blind, which means and, and so if you're applying to other places within the public health school, or if you're thinking, if you're like between an MPH and an SM, defer to Charlie later on and other things, but for the MPH, we actually don't wanna see GREs. We don't wanna see MCATs. We don't wanna see LSATs. We don't wanna see GMAT, whichever ones I haven't said. So the, what we do need to see if you were coming from a uh, country where English was not the language that you went to school in, not your native language, we do need to see either your TOEFL score or the, I don't know how to pronounce this one, the IELTS, the, um, but the, the, for the other ones, we actually do not, we have chosen due to the pandemic to, we know that there was not equal access for it. And we determined that test optional was only going to benefit some people. So therefore we, that is why we just don't want to look at it. What this does mean though, and I'm glad you asked Sarah, I've never asked this. Um, when we do look at them, what we're actually often wanting to see is um, that someone has enough quantitative skills that it's gonna be okay when they take our biostats and epi courses. And, and we never cut just on that, but we like to see that because if we see a struggle, then we will look more to transcripts and say, oh, how did she do in uh, calculus or stats in college? So it gives us like a, a deeper something to look at. So reviewing without test scores is harder for us because we can't see, we don't have like a, a starting board on test scores to look at. And now like LSATs were actually never useful for us on that. <laughs> but, but if, so if you're, one thing as a bit of advice for you is since we can't, even if you send them to us, we're not going to look at them. So therefore, if you have a way in your application to address your quantitative abilities, that is a positive thing for you to be doing. And that may be um, that a recommender that you've worked with specifically may know something about your quantitative abilities, or if you you know your transcript may already have this. If your transcript shows this, then that's great. But if you were like a you know an English major in college at a school that had no other requirements in the quantitative world, and we don't have a way to see it, it would be good to think about a way to address that. It could be even in your personal statement talking about things you've done, but that just would be a good thing to, to make sure you cover. Thanks, Anne. So we have a number of questions now for our student reps. Um, right. So be ready. Um, so I'm gonna ask um, Emma and Sundas, would you be able to share a little bit about what um, helped, what you feel like helped make your application stand out? Um, and then also um, once you, got to the School of Public Health. Um, could you describe a little bit about the culture, your experience so far, um, and other students you've been able to meet? Um, I can jump in. I'll try and remember all the different pieces of that question. Um, when I was writing my application, I think a really important thing for me personally was to figure out how I got to this point, what, what brought me here, and what um, what am I looking for in this program and how is that going to bring me to that next step that I want to get to? Um, and just trying to like clarify that, that timeline and tell my story through those three components. And I think you can interweave qualifications in that story. But for me, the most important was really trying to figure out what is it that I want and how is this going to help me get there and what kind of impact is that going to have like broader, um, my background, I'm, um, 
Norwegian American, so I have an MD from Norway. Um, so I was looking to pivot a little bit into public health, and I think this is a really excellent program to do that. I was lucky enough QM to do um, some summer courses, so I had already met a group of friends. Um, they were online before coming here, so we had a really close friend group from summer courses coming in, and you know I've just felt really welcome at the school. I think you know the locale, everyone around is even just entering the building and the people checking your, your card are always smiling. And I, you know, everyone's open for questions. Everyone's just like trying to figure out and where things are and what to do, what classes to take. And I feel like we're all in the same boat and that is really a great feeling. Um, and on top of that, everyone has so many different experiences to bring to the table that it really helps me clarify what I want moving forward. And you know, you can ask, what was that job like for you? What did you like? What did you not like? Um, you know, do like little mini interviews with everyone around you to find out um, what kind of opportunities are out there. Um, so it's it's been really great so far. Yeah. Uh, so hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Sundar Sabur, and I'm an MPS 65 student at Harvard from uh, Social and Behavioral Sciences. Uh, I'm also an MD from Pakistan, so I'm an international student. And uh, the thing which actually uh, really encouraged me to apply for the program is that uh, I had a lot of research experience in gender and racial disparities in US medicine. And so one of the concentrations of my program was specifically targeted towards the racial and gender disparities and equity. So this is one of the things which encouraged me to apply for this program. And um, before, uh, before starting it, uh, I wasn't sure if I'll be having my classes on campus or online, but is, is it going to be virtual? And so uh, lo and behold, the good news is it's on campus. So you need to be like, uh, be really strong with that because on campus, the organization is amazing. They do your regular COVID tests and everything is safe and sound. And I've been going there for a month and it's my COVID has been negative. So you can see the amount of precautions that the school is taking uh, to keep the students safe on campus. Uh, otherwise, and uh, other than that, uh, Boston is amazing. So I've never been to Boston before and it has been really good. They're very helpful with the students. Um, uh, I was really lucky to get a Harvard housing as well. So the college staff, the housing staff, everything is amazing. Uh, on campus, it's really easy to reach out to faculty and they are really privileged ones as well. So they are very happy and you know very friendly. So you don't need to be uh, intimidated by any of that. And uh, one more thing which I really love about Harvard is that you get to meet so many different people with so many different backgrounds, with different countries. So everybody uh, brings their own experience to the table. And it's really educating and inspiring on that part as well. And it's not just the degree in itself, but the whole overall experience that you get when you enter the building and before you leave. So it's it has been truly amazing, especially because it's on campus too. Thanks so much. Um, so Emma and Sudas, if you, um could very briefly let us know. So why Harvard? Why did you decide to apply to Harvard and then ultimately decide to come here to our programs? So I can speak for myself. After having been in um, Norway for around 10 years, I think I was ready for a change of scenery and a really international class. So for me, I was considering between um, London and London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and Harvard, which I think it, for international students is a pretty common um, consideration. I really looked at what faculty were doing um, within your field of interest. And so for me, I knew coming to Harvard was going to be the right thing because there were active projects and faculty working on the type of issues that I am interested in. And I think that's really been fabulous coming here, you know, just reaching out to faculty how Oh, welcome, welcoming they've been and how open they are to student collaboration. Um, so I think that's a real strength that the Harvard program has. And I also really appreciate coming, you know, from a background with an MD, I wanted to make sure I came into a program that had students with other backgrounds as well, because um, I think that really enriches public health fields. So those were the two um, deciding factors for me. 
Okay, uh, so for me, uh, a few of the deciding factors was that, uh, as Emma said, that people from different backgrounds come. So it's very interesting to see people in public health, you know, how do they bring their own experience and how we can work with them to, towards a certain goal. Uh, one other thing for Harvard was that um, it, it is linked with all the other schools at Harvard. So if you get admission in the MPH program, you can do courses in business school and Kennedy School and Harvard Medical School. So it's not just when you get in the HSPH college, you're just restricted to that area. The best thing about the program is that even if you're 45 or 65, you can take elective courses anywhere at Harvard, even if it's School of Design, if you're interested in designing or arts, you're truly open to take any of those. And um, yes, so as you said, to uh, choose, so I, I got the option to choose between John Hopkins and Harvard. And this was the particular reason of going for Harvard is that if we, even if you're in MPH program, you can take courses anywhere and which is really amazing and it also depends on what you want to do in future so um, the program at harvard it was very close to what i want to do in future and that is why i, I opted for that i'm just going to second the cross registration um point because i am taking classes at the kennedy school and at the graduate school of arts and sciences and it's just so it's so enriching getting sort of out of the I think healthcare is, is a bubble sometimes and just getting out and really speaking to people who are addressing the same issues from totally different backgrounds. So 100%. Thanks so much, that's wonderful. So Anne, uh, we have a couple questions about financial aid. Um, would, you, um, would you be able to talk a little bit about financial aid, how many students tend to get um, financial yes. aid from the school? Yes, so having, I just took a look at some of the questions and uh, so I'll try to, answer a bunch at the same time. And I come really not bearing a lot of good news, I just wanna say in this next part of things. So again, sometimes when you hear things about Harvard, like I was mentioning the Harvard College undergrad numbers, sometimes you hear Harvard financial aid information that just sounds like um, that there's money going out in all places. So it is in the MPH program, the majority of the admitted students actually do not receive a scholarship from the school. And of those who do receive money, uh, the most common award is a 25% tuition award. So Harvard on the graduate level for public health is unable to meet all need. Like I think you hear that about the undergraduate college that is not the case, but sadly on the public health graduate level. So what that means, somebody asked like I'm from a developing country and is there full tuition plus living expenses. It is really unusual, like in the, of, of all, of, you know, you just saw that there are like over 650 students. There are like a handful of students across the MPH who have full funding. Uh, those, the, what, there are some university-wide scholarships and fellowships, uh, such as the Commonwealth Fellowship, which is in partnership with uh, Harvard Medical School, in some cases, like the Commonwealth Fellowship, the Zuckerman Fellowship, the Knox Fellowship, which all have different criteria and eligibility. Some of those provide full funding plus stipend. And then there are a few presidential scholarships that cover full tuition with no um, stipend. These are really the exceptions rather than the norm. So I just, I want people to be super clear on that. We do our, our way of giving out financial aid takes into effect a lot of the different factors that you were, you know, like if you are from a developing country and we know you can't afford to come, but there's, it's still, there's going to be an expectation then if you're doing that, that you're pulling some funding in from somewhere else, which may be loans, it may be savings or other things, but it is the, um, that, I, that is, I don't know if I'm, am I covering all the questions that were asked there, Sarah, on that? On yeah, the I, I think so. I think so. And I would also just note, um, we do have a number, the, the university has a number of scholarships which may apply to specific populations. Um, so I definitely recommend um, looking at um, the, I think it's the general scholarship website 
Um, and we can try to find that link and put that into the chat to see if that's something that's helpful. The other plug that I would make um, is if you are wanting to be considered for financial aid, please make sure that you apply um, by the noted deadline. Um, otherwise you won't be able to be considered. Um, we do require that you apply for, apply for financial aid to be considered for financial aid. Um, someone asked if age is considered in selection, and I would say I'm not exactly sure if it, what that what the question behind that question specifically is, but I would I, I would say I guess I would say no. <laughs> I mean, it's like we see age, and we I I think we don't have a, a big thought one way or another as long as there is the work experience that we want to see, and then on the on the lower end, uh, we want to make sure that on the upper end, then you know we have, we've seen people of all different ages um, come through the program, and I think that actually just adds to our diversity. Thanks, Anne. Um, there was a question here about how many students are in different tracks. Um, I'll just note it really varies depending on. Um, each field of study, as Anne noted um, at the beginning of her presentation, our clinical effectiveness track has the largest number of students that can sometimes range between 80 and 90 students. Um, whereas some of our smaller fields of study, um, for example, our nutrition field of study may have 15 students. So it, there, it really varies. Um, so, uh, you know, there, there is definitely a nice cohort feel um, and, and some of our programs. And then the other piece I'd say, um, and Anne, please correct me if I'm wrong, that um, if you don't have specific experience, let's say in health management, um, you can still apply to those fields of study. It'll just be important in your application to highlight why this field of study um, is relevant and why you wanna learn these skills. Yeah, and I just looked back to that slide for a second to say the fields of study range from as small as seven in the OEH to 157 for clinical effectiveness. So okay. that's a, it's a very big range. Um, also to Sarah's point, so there are certain things within different fields of study that will make more sense and maybe enhance your ability to get in. So, but for example, like the health policy fields of study for the 45 and the 65 for us, the curriculum is quite US domestic focused. So that's an important thing to know because if you're uh, from Ghana and plan to return to Ghana, it actually may not be the most valuable experience for you. Like you actually might be really frustrated by learning about Medicaid and thinking, well, oh, how is this gonna help me? So that is something to think about because reviewers will wonder, like we would wanna see the, uh, a case for thinking, why, why would we wanna be, what, why study US health policy if there's no intention of, of working with that. So if you're thinking that, that's what I mean about tell your story and make your case for why otherwise, because it's a practice degree and we're gonna assume we're gonna go off and do some work with it. It's not just like an intellectual study of like, that's interesting, I learned about Medicaid. We, we want to see what you would be doing. So similarly, um, you know, a global health, if you're applying to the global health field of study, global health certainly likes to see people having had some experience working in the global health world. And they specify that, but um, just something to, to know with some of the differences. What else do we have in these questions? Uh, someone asked if past QM students mostly are MDs, and I'm gonna say yes, they very often are, or med students on their way to being MDs. And uh, as Emma can probably tell us, quant students, I mean, QM students, like they like their data. <laughs> yes, it, that is a benefit. Um, I can say, so I really resonate with what you were saying about health policy. So I'm a little bit of a policy nerd, but I am like planning to return to Norway. So it didn't make sense for me to do the health policy track. Um, but QM really gives a lot of flexibility. And so yeah. that has been the most important thing for me. I think that, not, not that everyone needs to apply for QM, but um, you gain skills that are super relevant no matter what 
direction you want to go in. And I think there is space for people who aren't envisioning a typical MD um, research kind of career. So I am looking to go into policy, but I do think that QM was the right fit for me. And Emma, I'm glad you say that because one thing that uh, is sort of enough, we know this in the NPH office, but we don't know that everybody knows this. So uh, the great unveil is that actually QM is really has more flexibility built into the curriculum than than other fields of study, which are requiring more, you know, very specific, like take, you know, certain requirements. QM does not have that. So you can be wanting to be able to crunch the data, but explore your interests in other ways. I will say with that caveat that you should be someone who loves to crunch the data because it's <laughs> that's <laughs> that's not the zone where people usually have to figure out ways to prove their quant chops to us because they're they, they've been following that all along. So but then I think then it's a perfect a perfect match if you have the interest and you want the flexibility. Thanks, Anne. I'm just, I, we have one more time for one more question or two more questions. Um, so I'm just going to look really quickly here. Um, can you, Anne, maybe we could talk a little bit about career paths that after you complete an MPH, um, what kind of opportunities there are? Um, and do, is there any data um, or maybe some general thoughts about how quickly students tend to find jobs? Yeah, so you know we have a career advancement office. I think I've changed their name recently, but uh, where lots of we have a lot of recruiters who come to campus or do virtual events now. Uh, we have a strong alumni network that both comes and helps students and posts positions and and so uh, and we we have a fair amount of data on this in the career website tells us different things, but our office, our career office, and thank you, Charlie, our career office and our um, alumni office actually survey people. We survey upon graduation and then later to, and have like very good career employment outcomes of most people having their jobs either. I mean, probably 2020 was a weird year, I'm gonna guess, but um, of people having their jobs landed by graduation or not. And most people do, well, we, we also have, you know, obviously if, if you were in med school, you return to med school, but in other ways, people um, go into different things. They may be using it as a time to pivot into a different field. Um, sometimes people are like, let me, I wanna dabble in consulting for a few years and then switch. But the resources of the networks of your classmates, the networks of alum, your practicum. We don't view your practicum as like a pathway directly to a job, but it sometimes helps you figure out your way to a different job. So there's a lot of different uh, avenues to make sure that you land in a career that's the one that you want to be going for. Great. Thank you so much, Anne. So recognizing that we have just about four minutes left, I want to pose one final question to both Anne and our two current students. And what final piece of advice would you give an applicant as they are learning more about the different NPH offerings, starting their application, just a parting word of wisdom you'd have based on some of your experiences. And why don't we start with Emma, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, I was just reflecting on, you know, I was sitting last year in you guys' spots and it's really been a journey, but I think um, the process can be very stressful and I think it's important to look at this as an opportunity. It's a really exciting time to explore a new area of your career or maybe pivot. And um, I learned so much about myself and my own interests just looking into the program. Um, but I would recommend what I really loved was the course guide that goes through. You can look at exactly the course requirements for each field of study and compare and really dig into that compared to what courses you think that you would wanna take. I think that's a helpful tip for trying to land um, which of the fields of studies might be right for you. Thanks, Emma. And Sundas, any parting words of wisdom or advice you can share with the group? Okay, so I will just echo what Emma said, and I would like to add, just see what you experience you already have and what you do in, 
and what you want to do in future. And keeping those things in mind, just look at the program to see what fits best for you. That's my advice for now. Well, then since you guys did sort of a, a, a more a mature version of what, what you should do, I'm just going to focus on that one little thing I said before, which is please get them in on time and possibly even early because we, I know I said this, but we cannot see it until, and reviewers can't see it until it's complete. So if, especially if you're, if you're international and your transcript has to go through any other processes, just begin the process early and, um, you know, maybe what else can I say? Have someone else, people look at your own, your statement and just make sure there's clarity, but make it be you, like have it come through as truly who, who you are. So that would, I think that would be all I could say for now. Absolutely. And someone asked, I know, for the last slide about with Megan's contact, um, which we will put the link in the chat, maybe. Can I do that? Okay. Come on, Megan, can you do that? Great. Thank you. Oh, nice. And then your calendar. Okay, great. All right. Perfect. Great. Thank you. Very good. Wonderful. Thank okay. you. Well, thank, thank you so much to Anne, to Sarah, to our two students, Emma and Sundas, and also to uh, Megan and Michael from the MPH team for joining today. So again, uh, we really appreciate you spending some time joining us from wherever you reside um, here in the US or around the world. We hope to see you again at future virtual visit week events. And please be in touch if you have any questions. Signing off from Boston, I'm Charlie with the admissions office. Take care and goodbye, everyone. Bye-bye.